Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, Japan's iSpace uh, crashed on the moon for the second time. Uh, their stream actually opened with a whole montage discussing the nature of failure and how the real failure isn't to try again. And to be honest, they picked a good day to crash on the moon because a lot of the media was looking at a big crash that happened elsewhere, where Elon Musk's criticism of Trump's big, beautiful bill finally turned into uh, the two of them shouting at each other on social media with, uh, you know, Trump threatening to cancel all of Elon's contracts and uh, Elon explaining that uh, the Epstein files haven't been released because Trump is heavily implicated. And while it appears to have calmed down a little this morning, a, a lot of us weren't surprised that this ended up happening. And look, I'm sure I could get a lot of clicks and a lot of engagement if I just talked about that story and talked about what Trump could actually do to, uh, you know, SpaceX and Tesla and all these things if he were, say, a vindictive, spiteful person that would use his power to attack those things. But no, we're, we are going to step away from that and actually talk about this crash. Because I have a greater understanding of the limits of rocket science and physics than I do of the limits of government power. So yes, iSpace, they started out you know, a long time ago as a competitor for the Google Lunar X Prize. That was where there was going to be a $30 million prize for the first private team to land on the moon and then demonstrate a traverse. And we had people, you know, groups from all levels uh, competing in this, and none of them actually were able to deliver on time. But now, a few years later, the routes that were planted sort of right by this competition are, are now, you know, starting to land on the moon. At this point, there isn't a prize anymore. They're getting funding from sponsors. They're getting people that are paying them to carry you know, payloads to the surface of the moon. For example, there was a micro rover on there that was supposed to land as part of this mission. And okay, technically, the rover did land. It's just that it's not going to be able to drive anywhere. And that's an unfortunate end to a pretty long mission. So this spacecraft launched back in January. It was dual manifested with uh, Firefly's much more successful Blue Ghost. And uh, iSpace, they have built a spacecraft which is super lightweight, super optimized. And that means that part of the optimization was to choose this very long circuitous route to the moon, which involves tickling the Lagrange points and falling in and saving themselves about 10% of the propulsion that they would otherwise need on the spacecraft. And that's a huge gain. Everything about this spacecraft has been designed to make it as efficient as possible, to make it as low cost as possible. And many of these engineering decisions are only possible because of modern technology. But on the other hand, they've made the spacecraft somewhat, you know, dependent on modern technology, which explains, you know, why you know, the Surveyor spacecraft were able to land on the moon successfully. But iSpace's much more high tech spacecraft uh, has its own problems. So anyway, most of the live stream didn't have anything live. What they had was telemetry that we could watch showing the spacecraft's position. It was in a polar orbit and it was going for a landing location on the North Pole of the Moon. So on the left, you've got this sort of graphic visualization of what the spacecraft is doing. On the right, you've got the numbers, the speed, the altitude, the time to touchdown. You also have uh, this main and assist. This is like the main thruster and the six uh, steering your know, control thrusters on the side and down the bottom there is an altitude uh, time graph that will show up later and you can also see in the visualization this yellow line that yellow line is of course pointing towards the sun so you can get an idea of the spacecraft's orientation the landing was broken into a number of different phases with different navigation requirements first of all they perform a small burn that just brings the peri loon down to about 20 kilometers for its approach this is performed on the other side of the moon and it then spends almost an hour slowly descending towards the surface with its velocity slowly increasing as it falls into the gravity well. Then when the spacecraft gets close to its target, it initiates the proper braking burn where it starts firing the engines and slowing the spacecraft down, burning the majority of the fuel as it slows the spacecraft to a point over its intended landing site. Then as it really slows down and gravity starts to have a greater effect, it's pitching up more and more to counteract gravity and essentially cancelling out horizontal velocity over the target landing site. And then finally during the terminal descent, it is coming almost straight down and it's using its onboard sensors to read the surface and uh, adjust the engine so that it comes to a stop just above the surface of the moon. At this point, it shuts off its main central thruster and uses this little thrusters for the actual touchdown. 
So now here's the telemetry a few minutes before landing. We're still in the braking burn phase and you can see that it's moving at a speed of about 600 kilometers per hour, altitude of about four kilometers. This is the kind of speeds and altitudes consistent with airplanes on the Earth. Now, as I understand it, at this point, these numbers are entirely based upon the vehicle state that's been derived from the orbit, the Doppler measurements, the onboard inertial uh, guidance system. It's not measuring its distance to the surface because it uses a LIDAR to do that and it has to be pointed down at the surface to be able to see it. And it's approaching sideways across the moon because that's the most efficient way. If you come straight down, you're getting a lot of gravity losses. That's what Surveyor did, but it meant that it had to have a much more powerful engine, much more heavier hardware. Anyway, this is the point where things start to go wrong. It enters the pitch over phase. Some of the numbers start to show a little weird, but also notice, by the way, that the model just clips through the surface of the moon. Again, remember I said about the derived model versus the you know, actual observations of the moon? It hasn't crashed, it's just they didn't quite know where the surface would be in their model. Also notice above the lander telemetry, it says simulation. So we've lost telemetry here and it's guessing at what it's doing. And in a moment, we'll get back live telemetry again and you'll see the numbers that it's actually using. And those actual numbers are not good. It's descending at 60 meters per second. That altitude is going down very, very quickly, uh, uh, more quickly than the spacecraft can decelerate. And then it shows negative, still says live, and we basically lose telemetry about this point. But based on the speed at which the altitude was decreasing, that was about 60 meters per second, which if it hit at that speed, that's not survivable. Anyway, ignore the telemetry in the top right. It doesn't show anything new. Instead, take a look at the little window on the bottom left where we have cameras into the control room. We can get some idea of the vehicle state by, you know, perhaps reading their faces as the engineers try to understand the data that they got back from their spacecraft just before they lost signal. So we'd get to look at this for a few more minutes and then they would switch over to B-roll and eventually they would have a press conference and put out a statement saying that uh, there was a problem with the LIDAR locking on during terminal descent and it gave them results too late for them to slow down in time. So what does that actually mean? Well, my interpretation is that, as I said, the LIDAR is only really useful when the thing starts to pitch over and point at the surface for terminal descent. So... The LiDAR basically hasn't been able to see anything useful. They're entirely measuring their vehicle state based on these, you know, the drive data from the orbit, from the Doppler stuff like and things like that. The first look they get at the surface is during this pitch over. And during that, they're following a program which isn't really slowing the spacecraft down because they don't know where the surface is. And so they get the signal too late and they can't slow down in time and the spacecraft smashes into the surface. If you remember the first Hakuto mission, they had a problem where they were measuring the altitude during approach and they went over a cliff and the cliff basically showed a rapid change in altitude, which the vehicle then rejected as bad and then said, don't trust this sensor anymore. So it proceeded to try to complete the landing using the derived data. And as a result, they ended up coming to a perfect stop at where they thought the zero altitude was, but that altitude was actually very high up and the spacecraft then fell and smashed into the surface. So this is kind of the other extreme where they're just basically descending at a set rate while they're waiting to get that data. And by the time they get that data, they simply don't have enough distance to slow themselves down. And that approach makes sense if you assume that the LiDAR can't get lock on because you're too high up. But if there's other problems, then uh, it can turn out that you don't get LiDAR lock until it's too late. So now I'm wondering what we're actually going to find on the surface. Are we going to find a crater? I don't think so. I think we'll find a scar. I think we might actually see evidence of the structure because I don't think it hit that fast. As I said, based upon the telemetry, it looked like the descent rate was typically about 50 to 60 meters per second. The deceleration by the thrusters was about 3 meters per second per second. But we don't need to blindly trust the telemetry they showed us on screen because we had amateurs around the world who were able to track it using satellite dishes. So this is from AMSAT DL in Germany. And what this is showing is the frequency spectrum. And on the right there, you see a big peak. That is the carrier wave. And you'll see if you look below, there's a waterfall plot showing how the frequency of that peak has changed over time. The frequency has been increasing as it's been slowing down, right? It was going away from us and now it's going away from us at a slower rate. Therefore, it's becoming progressively less redshifted. But the angle of that line on the waterfall plot is pretty much a direct measure of the deceleration of the spacecraft. And as you'll notice right at the top right, 
that angle has suddenly become more vertical. It's slowed its deceleration. This is during the moment where it was supposed to be doing the pitch over. And then it sort of st attempts to restore this and then the signal drops out completely. And so here's another plot by a Dutch radio telescope. And what I want to do here is zoom in on that last section. And as we zoom in, notice there's a sort of hazy cloud just above the line. That is the reflection of the lander signal from the surface of the moon. And you can see that as it gets closer to the moon, that reflection gets stronger and stronger until it too disappears. But yeah, during that moment where it begins to curve over, I think what's happening is it's transitioning to its vertical mode. And so it's in a mode where it's basically cancelling its horizontal velocity, but letting its vertical velocity maintain constant rate until it gets the, you know, the LiDAR return. And then once it gets that, you see the line starts to shoot up again as it basically puts on its brakes to try to land in time. And for there, we only get about, you know, like 15 seconds on that curve there. So if we assume it continues to decelerate at about 3 meters per second, you might naively think that 15 times 3, that's 45 meters per second, 15 meters per second, that's not so bad. But you have to remember it's coming straight down and you have to subtract the lunar gravity. So that more or less cuts the deceleration in half. And I think in that segment, it probably loses somewhere between 20 to 25 meters per second in a last ditch attempt to slow down in time. That means it hits at somewhere between 30 to 40 meters per second. That's 100 kilometers per hour, 60 miles per hour. And so I think when the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter flies over and sees it, it'll actually have a hard time finding it, but it will see pretty much a monolithic structure without much debris getting cast around. And that's such a shame because it was seconds away from doing this successfully. And so again, coming back to the question of why does it seem so much harder to land on the moon today, compared to 50 years ago. Well, they're choosing a much harder way to land on the moon. In the old days, they came straight down. That meant their sensors only needed to point in one direction, but it meant that they had to have much more powerful engines to make up for the gravity losses. The trajectories needed for that kind of orbit also required the rockets to throw the spacecraft much faster, which meant a more expensive launch process. And then these old spacecraft, they only had to carry a very small amount of payload. The surveyors only really carried a camera. Their mission was to show that a soft lunar landing was possible. And that meant that there wasn't any need for fancy scientific instrumentation or payloads from customers. Uh, iSpace have to put a lot more payload per pound onto their spacecraft to make it a viable business. And so we'll probably get an update on this when the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter passes over in a couple of weeks. And uh, hopefully we'll get to see iSpace trying to do this again. And I will once again be watching and wishing them every success. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.